The West Penra Papers A Journey Through the Multiverse The Second Level of Learning HTTP colon slash slash westpenry.com Prophecy Paper Number 2 The Closing of the Nanosecond By Wes Penra, Saturday, October 13, 2012 HTTP colon slash slash westpenry.com, Part 4 7. The Importance of Understanding the Real Meaning Behind Service to Self and Service to Others A Great Battle Exists, A Fight for the Souls, Spirits and Bodies of Humankind, For the Core of Your Being is So Vital That Many Seek It. Keeping You in Ignorance, Most Particularly in Linear Thinking, Forces You to Produce the Frequency of Fear Rather Than the Frequency of Your Own Natural Biological Inheritance, Unique to You, Which Is the Vitality of Love. Love is not stored anywhere quite like it is stored in you because you are part of a library and are a priceless experiment as well. This message from the Pleiadians, this time from 1998, tells us a lot. It educates us that there is a battle for our souls, and it is fought in the non-physical, in other dimensions. We are special in more than one way, as I have said throughout this level of learning. We are royal, because we were originally seated as an experiment, directly orchestrated by the Queen of the Stars, and we have her DNA, which makes us directly connected with the 96% of dark matter and dark energy, the Goddess Universe. By capturing us, modifying us, and keeping us ignorant, those who took us under their wings and let no other have us, could then start sucking our life energy out, until very little was left, and substituted with other kinds of energies, belonging to the 4% Universe. However, this lesser energy is not sustaining us very much longer, because it's not how we were made to be, and we don't absorb it as well as beings who were created here. This is another reason the Syrians want to create a machine world with half humans, half cyborgs, and less soul energy. This way, they can still suck the last of our goddess energy out and use us as super soldiers and invincible star warriors. 7.1 The term unconditional love misunderstood the love inside that the Pleiadians are talking about is the love of the goddess, the ultimate love, some call it unconditional, but even that word has been misunderstood, therefore I prefer calling it ultimate love. Ultimate love is greater than we think, because it spans over all spectrums. On one level it can be when you have such understanding for yourself and fellow man that you let other people be the way they really are without feeling judgmental about them. You give them ultimate love which is ultimate knowledge and ultimate understanding of that knowledge, and the application of it. The other being feels he or she can be totally themselves all the time when they are with you, whether they are sad, angry, happy, quiet, chatty, when you show this attribute, the other person will eventually peel off their layers of pretense and personae they have taken on in this lifetime and previous ones, just to please other people in hope of being accepted by people and society as a whole. You are doing people the ultimate favor by applying this wisdom on them. The reason I am not using the term unconditional love anymore is because I noticed how it had been misunderstood and misused, so the person who tried to practice it became a target for those who wanted to hurt them. It has gone so far that people believe that unconditional love is when you are accepting people's most horrible behavior, because that's a part of their journey. So when someone who is evil is spreading lies about you, or somebody else, or is beating up his wife and kids, the person who thinks he or she is all about unconditional love doesn't necessarily like what they're seeing, but they think it's part of the other person's journey, and therefore it should be left alone. Ultimate love, on the other hand, is when you have a person in front of you whom you know is beating his wife, and dare to confront him with it. You have such an ethics presence that you can go up to a person that is evil and tell them what they're doing is destructive and not acceptable behavior. You say it without anger or any mice motions, but with a presence that is unshakable. The other person will back off and either listen from the shock of it all, or start running. But you know that this evil person can't get better until they are confronted with what they're doing, and maybe you are so skilled that you can even spot entity possession. If so, be careful not to challenge the entity it can be very dangerous but tell the entity you want to talk to the real person, not the entity. 
the Pleiadians are experts on this in their lectures when someone in the audience with entity possession let the entity speak. They have no tolerance for that. You know that underneath all that evil, is a scared little being who doesn't dare to be himself, but think they can survive better by controlling others. Ultimate love shows that you love that person and want to bring him slash her out, but have no empathy for the part of them, or the entity, who is causing the evil. None whatsoever. The late American singer, poet, and songwriter, Jim Morrison of The Doors, was interviewed by Lizzie James sometime in the late 1960s. I was told about this interview a few days ago and was amazed how profound Jim was and this was way back. It took the world more than 40 years to catch up, but to be honest, we have actually not caught up yet. Please read, because it is pretty good and thought-provoking. Interview with Jim Morrison Lizzie James, I think fans of The Doors see you as a savior, the leader who'll set them all free. How do you feel about that? It's kind of a heavy burden, isn't it? Jim Morrison, it's absurd. How can I set free anyone who doesn't have the guts to stand up alone and declare his own freedom? I think it's a lie people claim they want to be free everybody insists that freedom is what they want the most, the most sacred and precious thing a man can possess. But that's bullshit. People are terrified to be set free they hold on to their chains. They fight anyone who tries to break those chains. It's their security, how can they expect me or anyone to set them free if they don't really want to be free? Lizzie, why do you think people fear freedom? Jim, I think people resist freedom because they're afraid of the unknown. But it's ironic. That unknown was once very well known. It's where our souls belong. The only solution is to confront them confront yourself with the greatest fear imaginable. Expose yourself to yourself to your deepest fear. After that, fear has no power, and fear of freedom shrinks and vanishes. You are free. Lizzie, what do you mean when you say freedom? Jim, there are different kinds of freedom there's a lot of misunderstanding. The most important kind of freedom is to be what you really are. You trade in your reality for a role. You trade in your senses for an act. You give up your ability to feel and in exchange, put on a mask. There can't be any large-scale revolution until there's a personal revolution, on an individual level. It's got to happen inside first. You can take away a man's political freedom and you won't hurt him unless you take away his freedom to feel. That can destroy him. Lizzie, but how can anyone else have the power to take away from your freedom to feel? Jim, some people surrender their freedom willingly but others are, are forced to surrender it. Imprisonment begins with birth. Society, parents, they refuse to allow you to keep the freedom you are born with. There are subtle ways to punish a person for daring to feel. You see that everyone around you has destroyed his true feeling nature. You imitate what you see. Lizzie, are you saying that we are, in effect, brought up to defend and perpetuate a society that deprives people of the freedom to feel? Jim, sure, teachers, religious leaders even friends, or so-called friends take over where the parents leave off. They demand that we feel the only feelings they want and expect from us. They demand all the time that we preform feelings for them. We're like actors turned loose in this world to wander in search of a phantom, endlessly searching for a half-forgotten shadow of our lost reality. When others demand that we become the people they want us to be, they force us to destroy the person we really are. It's a subtle kind of murder, the most loving parents and relatives commit this murder with smiles on their faces. Lizzie, do you think it's possible for an individual to free himself from these repressive forces on his own all alone? Jim, that kind of freedom can't be granted. Nobody can win it for you. You have to do it on your own. If you look to somebody else to do it for you somebody outside yourself you're still depending on others. You're still vulnerable to those repressive, evil outside forces, too. Lizzie, but isn't it possible for people who want that freedom to unite to combine their strength, maybe just to strengthen each other? It must be possible. Jim, friends can help each other. A true friend is someone who lets you have total freedom to be yourself and especially to feel. Or not feel. 
Whatever you happen to be feeling at the moment is fine with them. That's what real love amounts to letting a person be what he really is. Most people love you for who you pretend to be. To keep their love, you keep pretending preforming. You get to love your pretense. It's true, we're locked in an image, an act, and the sad thing is, people get so used to their image they grow attached to their masks. They love their chains. They forgot all about who they really are. And if you try to remind them, they hate you for it they feel like you're trying to steal their most precious possession. Lizzie, it's ironic it's sad. Can't they see that what you're trying to show them is the way to freedom? Jim, most people have no idea what they're missing. Or society places a supreme value on control hiding what you feel. Our culture mocks primitive cultures and prides itself on suppression of natural instincts and impulses. Lizzie, in some of your poetry, you openly admire and praise primitive people Indians, for instance. Do you mean that it's not human beings in general but our particular society that's flawed and destructive? Jim, look at how other cultures live peacefully, in harmony with the earth, the forest animals. They don't build war machines and invest millions of dollars in attacking other countries whose political ideals don't happen to agree with their own. Lizzie, we live in a sick society. Jim, it's true, and part of the disease is not being aware that we're diseased. Our society has too much to hold on to and value freedom ends up at the bottom of the list. Lizzie, but isn't there something an artist can do? If you didn't feel you, as an artist, could accomplish something, how could you go on? Jim, I offer images I conjure memories of freedom that can still be reached like the doors, right? But we can only open the doors we can't drag people through. I can't free them unless they want to be free more than anything else. Maybe primitive people have less bullshit to let go of, to give up. A person has to be willing to give up everything not just wealth. All the bullshit he's been taught all society brainwashing. You have to let go of all that to get to the other side. Most people aren't willing to do that. 7.2 The term catalyst misunderstood. It's the same thing when you see people starving in Africa, and you hear children and women being raped in war. It could be any horrific situation that you hear of. There is no justification for letting such things happen among us. At the end of 2008, a self-proclaimed Illuminati insider who called himself Hidden Hand started a cult-like following on the Internet. He showed up on the above top secret forum and answered questions from the members. This Q&A session was of quite high quality in the sense that it is pretty easy to see that Hidden Hand was genuine. Very few people have doubted his authenticity. I collected this entire interview and posted it on my Illuminati news website Hidden Hand was very slick. He and his likes, not sure about gender, but use male here for simplicity, must have felt threatened by the awakening, and thought that people may turn against them, because he justified his own extremely evil deeds, and those of his kind, with saying that they had sacrificed themselves for us to become our catalysts. They had arrived in the past from a much higher dimension and descended here to do as much evil deeds as necessary to wake mankind up. By doing so, he said, they have created their own karma, and soon have to experience the other side of them coin, when it's their turn to be extremely suppressed. Hidden Hand also referred us to the RA material, which he suggested that we read for a fuller understanding. The RA material is talking about negative and positive densities and service to self versus service to others. Hidden Hand, H.H., referred to himself as coming from a higher positive density, but decided to come back here and switch to a negative density in order to become our catalysts. So he is thus doing ultimate service to others, Sto, by being ultimate service to self, STS, according to himself. He won many sympathizers and people started thinking of the global elite and all the evil they do as something good, because it enhances our own development. How? Because by doing this amount of evil, it helps us seeing that something is wrong, and we can more easily wake up and evolve. As a matter of fact, H.H. said that without people like him, we would continue living in our slumber and never evolve. We would be slaves forever. This rang true to a lot of people. 
now it is time to debunk what Hidden Hand was teaching us. Being extremely clever, he was very well prepared. By saying what he was saying, those who were the worst threats to the Syrians once again would agree with them and their actions. Twisted and turned, of course, but it worked. However, the reason it worked was because under current circumstances there is truth in this, which he could use to twist into his favor and fool us once again. Here is the plain truth, if the Syrians hadn't trapped us in the beginning and exposed us to all this evil that they have no problems manifesting, we wouldn't have needed any catalysts at all. The reason we need catalysts now is because they are still keeping us trapped and manipulated, and continue treating us like slaves and guinea pigs. If they instead leave or planets and don't return until they have evolved spiritually, and we let them, we won't need them as evil catalysts. This, dear reader, is the naked truth, and this is what they hid from us in the Hidden Hand interview. So don't fall for their manipulative agenda to get the sheep back into the fold again, which they managed to do pretty well back in 2008. Now, when you know the truth about the Syrian overlords you can more easily see how people like Hidden Hand deceive us. I fell for it, too, for a while. In summary, there is no reason why we humans should justify any of the evil the Syrian overlords manifests here among us, and there is no reason why we should accept the evil some of the humans do to others. Evil is evil and it is degraded in misuse of energy. Therefore, ultimate love is to understand this and point it out where we see it, in order to get mankind on track. It is also our hope that in the future, those who now refuse to look at their own horrible behavior, will come to their senses and get affected by the divine energies of ultimate love and light the rest of us are working with. In the end, we want a universe where ultimate love is the norm, and all star races have the knowledge necessary to apply this wisdom to self and others. 7.3 The Importance of Love of Self, Stowe vs. STS Revisited for the Last Time I once again want to address the subject of service to self, STS, and service to others, Stowe because these terms are used a lot in channeled material. If I am correct, these terms started with the RA material in the early 1980s, and continued with the Cassiopeians, a channeled collective which has a very similar signature to that of the RA collective. After that, many other entities started using the same terms, interestingly enough. The only ones I've seen debunking them are the Pleiadians, and again I must say I agree with them. They have provided me and others with so much profound information over the years and have had a great influence on my awakening, more than many people think. They are far from the only ones, but they have been a major influence, and extremely helpful. Therefore, when people say they have an agenda and we shouldn't trust them, I know they are correct about the agenda, it's out in the open the Pleiadians were the first to admit to that, but the information is often invaluable. I see and hear about people who are very concerned that if they don't manage to do 51%, or more, STO than STS, they are doomed and can't ascend to the fourth and fifth dimensions. Therefore, they are constantly in stress and are anxious about their status. That itself, if we are cynical, is STS, because if you constantly think about how you are going to save yourself, by default you are STS. So whomever came up with this nonsense knew what they were doing. It is absolutely nothing wrong with helping others, but your first responsibility is that to yourself. Hence, in terms of STS and STO as stated in the RA material, that would be very STS, wouldn't it? Well, I am going to state that STS is actually more important than STO, if we have to choose one of the two. But it's more complex than that, so let's continue. Let's start with the following Pleiadian statement, humans who do not operate with love of self and love of the planet will be departing in vast numbers very quickly after exposure to the rays entering Earth. This is how important the Pleiadians think STS is. If we don't feel this immense love of self, and the planet, people will die in vast numbers. Here is another Pleiadian quote before we round it off, often those who continue to take care of others get caught up in the role of providing and mistake this for their identity and purpose. What has come out of the STS-STO debate is a new kind of fear, which is very serious, 
because it addresses the person's possibilities to evolve and ascend to higher dimensions and densities. Very little can be more stressful than that. Of course, not everybody see it as stressful, either, but enjoy what they're doing. At least this is what they say, when perhaps, if they look deep enough inside, underneath any type of denial, they may actually be very stressed, too. But I leave that for each person to look at for themselves. The way I see it, and I find this very important, is that we need to mainly concentrate on our own issues. In the nanosecond, we have a free ride on the waves of enlightenment, where we have the chance to deal with our timeline issues and become whole as a spirit, and eventually merge with our oversouls. We do that by raising our own frequency and become an example for others. Those who are connected to you in one way or another will feel your energies, distances don't matter, and they will be affected positively from your just being you. But by raising your own frequency you are doing so much more than that, too. You help raising the frequency of the whole planet, which will eventually break down the prison walls. This is so, because Earth, from Syrian manipulation, is set to a certain frequency, which will hide the planet from being seen by other star beings, and inaccessible by most. By raising the frequency of the mass consciousness, we change the frequency of the whole planet, and this is our main task right now. Does this mean that we should just neglect others who need help? No, not at all. We can still give help when asked for, but there are certain universal rules when doing so, which have to be taken into consideration. I have talked about this before, but I have seen how hard it is for it to sink in, because good people are so used to helping out, hands on. 1. Only help someone when help is asked for. Don't help just because you see somebody struggle with a problem. Of course, if someone falls on the street, you will be there to help, that's obvious, but I am talking about somebody else's life situations either for the first time or recurring. Observe, but don't offer help until help is asked for. I will explain why in a moment. 2. When help is given, it must be help to self-help, as much as it's possible. Don't do the job for somebody else, let the person do the job themselves, but when asked for, give advice if you feel you can, but the advice should cause an insight for the other person. These are the two simple rules, and they are based upon the same core value. Each person is learning their own lessons in life and must not be interfered with. Too often people interfere and believe they are helping. Then they get surprised when the person they help doesn't seem very appreciative, and sometimes even start attacking the one who's assisting. This often happens in parents-slash-children relationships and between married couples. The core thing here is that if a person is told exactly what to do, or someone is doing it for them, they never learn. Even if something seems obvious to you, it may not be to the other person, who needs to figure it out. By figuring it out themselves, no matter what it takes and they have to go through, they are perhaps figuring out something that has bothered them for lifetimes, and once they solve the problem themselves, they have accomplished a lot. This is how we heal along the lines of time. It can only be done by the person themselves, not by somebody else, because it's inner work. I know it's hard not to interfere when we see that we can solve a problem for another, but ultimate love is to let that person have their space and figure it out on their own, and when asked for, give advice which will help them see by doing their own thinking. And just to be more obvious, if the neighbor comes over and asks you to help him carry something up on this truck, of course it's okay to help out. This is not the kind of help I'm talking about. I am relating to life issues and life problems a person seems to have, which may be recurring, patterns that the person has a hard time to break. This is where profound advice can be the best help to self-help. This is when the person afterwards comes up and thanks you from all their heart. Because you granted them the opportunity to solve the problem themselves, you only provided something they could think about. On a grander scale. This is why star beings from other worlds should not interfere with an evolving race. It's a break in the law of non-interference. We break that law all the time on a smaller scale, and it creates upsets at best, and confusion along the lines of time at worst. Also, when you solve a problem for another, 
they feel less powerful than you when they are not. Brought to more of an extreme, this is how idolism and heroism is created. 8. The Atlantic Karma, Triple Helix DNA, and the Cleansing of the Planet It's quite obvious that we are living out the Atlantean Karma in present time, especially here in America, but also in many other parts of the world. When it was decided upon that America was going to become the new Atlantis, and the Freemasons and the Rosicrucians arrived here in the late 1400s, the stage was set. This is where people who had any major connection with Atlantis were going to live out their karma, and hopefully resolve it. There is a big cleansing going on on this planet at this particular time, and like the Pleiadians say, there is nothing we can do about it. We can see how old magicians from that time are now coming back, the same people, another time, but somewhat similar. The technology we have now is different but still similar. Overall, we are reliving that epoch once again. We know Atlantis was destroyed, much so due to misuse of energy, and we now stand in front of the same fork on the road. Last time we chose destruction, so what are we going to choose this time? Just like then, there are now people who can see what is playing out before their eyes, and it's pretty stunning at times. We literally see the same people doing the same thing over again for the same purpose. This time we are misusing energy even worse than we did back then, and it's alarming even for star races outside our solar system. We are manipulating DNA again, and black magicians are trying to produce what they call triple helix DNA, something that is not only isolated to the Thule order and people such as Jarl Vidar, Michael Noel Prescott and Supreme Rockefeller. The Pleiadians are also talking about it in their books and lectures. They say the following about triple helix. The great tidal wave of light, as expressed through the great Uranus-Neptune conjunctions of 1993, brought an infusion of cosmic rays onto the planet, creating a potential third strand of DNA in the masses. As the rebundling and reordering progresses, you will create a more evolved nervous system that will facilitate new data to move itself into your consciousness. It the great tidal wave of light triggered the light-encoded filaments to draw together and bundle that third helix. This bridged the electrical current inside your bodies that will access the self you know to the multidimensional self. So, according to the Pleiadians, the triple helix was created in the DNA of the masses already in 1993. What Jarl Vidar does back in Germany is to test the blood of a person to see if he or she has the dormant triple helix in their DNA. If they do, he uses the Vril machine, which is basically hooked up to the Neoma, the universal energy, which in Star Wars is called the Force, so the person can be activated on a distance. Time and distance are no longer of any significance. If the person activates, he or she becomes multidimensional in some terms, and for many, it can be a pretty overwhelming thing. Prescott told me about his own activation back in 2009, and he said it took quite a while for him to get used to it and it was even scary at first when he noticed he had access to the invisible realms. He could now see what we can't see with our five senses. The problem with triple helix activation the way it is done by the Thule order is not only that it overwhelms people and can even make them go insane, but it is also not lasting, the blood activation has to be repeated once a year. Also, it's not meant to be tampered with like they do, it's a natural procedure which will take its time and activate gradually. However, the Thule Order and those who work on fulfilling prophecy don't have time to wait, they think they need activated people now to do the job required by them. Needless to say, the Pleiadians oppose to any such behavior. They were asked in a lecture a couple of years ago about Triple Helix, and they said that no one should get involved in any such project, although they never mentioned the Thule Order in specific, although it is project like theirs they are referring to. Our chance to get out of this mess needs to happen on a level that is natural and is given the time it needs to develop. Everything else is a step backwards.